Um, hi, so we're on the third talk of the morning at CoCan 2012. Uh, we've got uh, Tom Wilkie from Akunu here, and he's going to talk about real-time analytics with um, Apache Cassandra. Uh, so, Tom, thanks very much for coming along this morning. Thank you, John. And um, I'll, uh, I'll hand you over to the audience. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, this is my first time I've done a, a conference to a camera, so uh, you'll have to bear with me. So yeah, as John said, my talk is going to be about uh, real-time analytics with Apache Cassandra. I'll include a little bit of knowledge about, you know, a little bit of discussion about Apache Cassandra in here, but mainly focusing on what you're using it for. Not really, it's not going to be one of those talks where you go over all the different features of Cassandra and so on. So the motivation for this talk is on how do you combine big data with real-time results? How do you get instant feedback from massively large data sets from really fast moving streams um, and in general you know we think that's pretty hard and that's what we've been trying to uh, trying to tackle so the things we're trying to build we're trying to build tools that allow you to do uh, dashboarding that allow you to do sort of trending analysis you know seeing what's trending on Twitter would be a great example of something you can do with these techniques and and what's more we want it to be kind of interactive so we want you to be able to you know drill down into the results so, slice and dice things various ways. Um, what I mean by real time? Well, I'm looking at a page refresh cycle. So I'm not talking about financial services, you know, bounded by milliseconds, and I'm not talking about, uh, I think, um, Cloudera came out with a new real time big data system where they class real time as minutes. I'm talking about sort of tens to hundreds of milliseconds here. Great. So moving on, how do people um, deal with this at the moment? Well, Ha, a bug in Keynote already. This is uh, one of those new Retina Macs, I'm afraid. Those, those logos are supposed to be slightly larger. But anyway, so the first solution people use, and this is what you'll find the telcos and the banks using at the moment to deal with these kind of problems, is your traditional SQL databases like Oracle. And uh, that works very well. It costs a lot of money. Um, and you know your scalability options are quite limited. And really, I'm here to talk about some new options that, that hopefully are going to come in significantly lower price points. So Hadoop is another good example. I mentioned Cloudera a second ago. Lots of people are using Hadoop for big data. It's pretty much the go-to tool for big data. But realistically, Hadoop's a batch system. MapReduce, and specifically, is, is very much a batch processing system. And it's not optimized for sort of interactive real-time workloads. So I, I did mention Cloudera's Impala, this new, uh, what they claim to be real-time um, analytics system. But, but really, that still has to process all the data you do for your query. Um, and it really, you know, they're measuring real time in minutes, you know, have a cup of tea real time, um, which is still better than Hadoop's hours, but it's not as good as uh, our sort of tens of milliseconds. So finally, what we found, uh, Akunu found, especially when we released our first version of Cassandra, was that people were using this to build uh, real time analytics frameworks. Um, so they're using some of the really cool features in Cassandra. Cassandra's got great support for real-time, high-throughput counters. So Cassandra can count things. And it doesn't sound that impressive, but big, it can do it at you know tens of thousands of things at counter updates a second. And it can do it over a, a sets of, of tens or hundreds of machines. And it can deal with failure. And it can deal with partitions in the network and all of these kind of things. So actually, this is quite a powerful sort of tool to build your, your real-time analytics solution on. So we found a lot of customers were building their own frameworks and their own solutions, and they were getting you know, arbitrarily complicated and incompatible. And so we came along and we built our own framework that allows you to do this in a kind of pseudo SQL-ish way. So really, the talk is mainly going to be about how you would do this on top of Cassandra. Um, I'm not going to talk about our product that much, maybe at the end. Maybe I'll give you a bit of a demo if you're good. Um, but realistically, I'm just going to show you, lift the skirt a little bit, and show you all the different techniques we use to build these real-time uh, analytics functions on top of Cassandra. It's going to be a bit of a smorgasbord of how you might build one, uh, hopefully, so you can go and build them at the end. Right then. So it's going to, the talk's going to be based around actually three examples of how you do three different things. And hopefully, you guys can uh, piece that all together and figure out you know, uh, how to build something more complicated using these examples. So the first example is, I want to know all the mentions of a particular keyword. You know, of course, the keyword's going to be Akunu in this example. But uh, talks of a particular, uh, mentions of a particular keyword on Twitter between two dates. 
And what's interesting is, for this query, I actually am not going to specify the two dates, and I'm not going to specify the keyword. So what I'm going to want to build is some kind of you know, aggregated index or something where I can very quickly go and find out the mentions of a keyword between two dates. If you did this with Hadoop, uh, at least with traditional MapReduce, you need to go through about 30 billion tweets between those two dates, and that's about 4.2 terabytes of data. So on a large Hadoop cluster, maybe that's you know maybe they can get that down to maybe 10 minutes, but still, it's not a page refresh cycle. So what are we going to do? So I said we're going to build this kind of aggregated index, and we're going to store that index in Cassandra. Um, so for every tweet we ingest, and we can do this in real time, or we can batch load them. But ideally, for every tweet we ingest in real time, we're going to break this tweet up and update a bunch of different counters that represent maybe the keywords in that tweet. And we're going to make sure the format of our index is, is arranged such that answering that query I previously said of, tell me the mentions of a keyword between two dates, is as easy as just reading a few of those counters. And even better than that, what we're going to do is optimize for some of the properties of Cassandra. So Cassandra has a fantastic random write performance. So we can do this breaking a tweet up into a bunch of counters and not do too much of an impact on performance. But it also has very good, Cassandra has very good um, sequential range query performance. So if I say, please fetch me 10 rows, that will, um, underneath on disk, that will show it, not 10 rows, sorry, 10 columns in a row. On disk, that will normally result in just a small number of, of disk IOs, not you know one for every item in that row, but typically one, you know, one or two for the entire row. So this is why Cassandra is particularly good. It's very good at random ingests, and it's very good at, at column range queries. So first thing we do is we get our, our, our stream of tweets. I've actually, there's actually some code on my GitHub. If you go on to um, github.com slash akunu, I think I called it painbird, because this is all inspired by something Twitter did that they called rainbird, but um, I don't think they ever open sourced it, so I wrote my own in Python. So anyway, that, that takes a, a, a stream of tweets, and we just use the Twitter fire hose there, or, or I think they have something called the garden hose, which is a, um, a lower throughput version of the fire hose. We're going to break that tweet up into a set of tokens, and this is kind of where you can do a bit of magic, and you can stem the words, and you can you know, drop hashes and, and, and drop at symbols and stuff to make clean up the data set, if you like. And then we're going to just insert timestamp comma tweet into uh, our database. And uh, for that insert, we, you know, we're going to we're going to have a, an increment of plus one to say this was mentioned at this time. Um, and that's it, pretty much. So this is pretty straightforward. That's how you build the index. To query the index, you just say, OK, give me all mentions you know, between these two ranges. And you get something, you get something back like this. And then you can plot a, plot a pretty graph or, or whatever it is you like to do. Now, that all looks very, uh, very easy. right? It's like, OK, well, that was easy. Why did we bother doing this? Well, unfortunately, in Cassandra, Keys are distributed randomly around the ring. Okay, and we do this for a very good reason. We do this so you get a very balanced um, distribution of your data across the nodes. Uh, but unfortunately, this also means that you can't do those range queries, like I just said. You can't say, please give me, you know, if I said, please give me keys one to two in this ring, you'd see it actually return one, three, and two in that order, which is bonkers, right? So you can't do that range query. So we have to be a little bit more clever. Um, and Cassandra has this fantastic support for very wide rows. So every column in a row, sorry, the columns in any given row does not have to be the same as the columns in any other row. And the width of the rows doesn't have to be the same. And effectively, you can think of Cassandra not as a table database, but actually more as a, a nested set of dictionaries, um, where you know as you go deeper into your nesting, it's very efficient to do range queries across those dictionaries. So. Instead of this table where we're going to have our keys in a nice order and then just a single like, a single cell that says the number of mentions of that key at that time, we're actually going to break it up into a more of a two-dimensional data structure. We're going to say the key is going to now be the day and the term you know, into one composite key, and the column is going to be the minute. So whenever we, do, uh, whenever we get a tweet, we still break it up into a number of terms and insert each term into the database. But now we insert it under a given row key and under a given column key. And, and I like to call these the row key a big bucket. So you might have day, and then your column key might be minute. Or your row key might be week, and your column key might be day. And this allows you to do the kind of zoom in and Google Finance-esque zoom in and zoom out on your data. I'm not going to show you that here, though. 
So once we've broken this up, this is great because now the queries we do on this table are only ever across the columns in a row. So we do a, a, a column slice effectively across the columns in a row, and we never actually do a slice between the um, between the different rows in the database. And because, as I said earlier, Cassandra distributes the the values in its database based on its row key, all of the values for a particular row will go to a particular host and will be nice and efficient on disk. Okay. So once we've done that, we can now do those queries. Oh, sorry. We can now do those queries, and we've now got a very efficient way of seeing how many mentions of a particular term you can, you know, happened on Twitter recently. And as I say, this what I've just gone through is exactly uh, what's online on GitHub uh, on this painbird dot, well, just painbird, I think it's called. And there's all the Python scripts and everything, so you can go and play with it and, and see how that works. So moving on, you know, we now want a more general solution. Now I had, I, I have a previous solution now, which is for a very specific query. Now I want a way of, you know, pre-declaring more general queries so that, you know, this can be a more general solution so that people can configure it for the particular queries that they want. Um, yeah, so let's move on to this. Now, the example I'm now going to use is a little bit more complicated. It's Google Analytics. So we're going to build, in inverted commas, a, a real-time version of Google Analytics. And as you can see by the Google Analytics uh, homepage, you might want to show the slide for this. Yeah, on. Okay. <clears throat> Um, as you can see by the Google Analytics homepage, the top is really just a count grouped by day. You know, we're really going to introduce this idea of grouping here. You know, we've maybe got some count distincts, which I'm going to talk about at the end. Um, we've got some normal counts, some averages, and again, an average is just a sum and a count combined. Uh, we can group by geography, perhaps, group by browser, and, and so on. Um, so I'm going to show you how to sort of generalize what I said to do all of these different things. So what we do is we we treat now this table on the right is uh, is what you might imagine this this materialized view looks like in Cassandra on the left of this table uh, to the left hand side of this thick black line is uh, the row keys so they're the row keys on which Cassandra will do the distribution and on the right are all the columns and values so on the on the right hand side the arrow sort of indicates this column key maps to this value and all of the values are just counters so when we get an event that says somebody visited my web page, they were customer one, their session ID was 102, whatever that means. They were in the UK, they were using Internet Explorer. Can that be right? Does anyone in the UK use Internet Explorer anymore? And uh, it, they did it at two minutes past 10. So what we'll then do is we'll break this, uh, this update up into a series, of, uh, a series of counter updates. And what we'll do is we'll say, OK, so that update was at two minutes past 10. So for the 10 o'clock row, we'll update the two minutes past cell to say there was an event at two minutes past 10. We'll also update the all cell, like the empty set key, if you like, which says this allows us to say, answer the query rather, how many uh, hits were there at 10 o'clock, or in, in the hour of 10 o'clock. But we'll also go, you know, where key, uh, the row keys, which now kind of symbolize the where clause of the, um, so yeah, they symbolize the where clause of the, of the query, if you like. You know, we might also want to ask where clauses around where were they? Were they in the UK? So this guy was, so we'll update the UK row. And what's more, you can start to generalize this more and say, okay, well, what happens if the where clause is where in the UK and where equals 10 o'clock? Then we can, okay, we'll combine this two and we'll do, the, uh, we'll do a composite key of UK and 10 o'clock as well. Um, and so on. So we'll go and update all of this. So really the take home for here is that the more general solution is to treat the row key as the sort of instantiation of the where clause, so the combinatorial explosion of all the different values you might want to do your where clauses on. And the column key here is really now the, the sort of instantiation of the group clause. If you say group by minute, then you're going to have to have a column key that signifies minute. And if you say group by user, as you can see in this slide uh, under the UK row, you know that's to satisfy the query where you know, geo equals UK group by user. Um, and what, you know, the significance here is that we can do a range query over those columns in a row very, very efficiently. And this is how we can answer these group by clauses very efficiently. So that's how we ingest an event and how we query. Well, again, the queries are just a simple read, maybe a single cell or maybe a range of cells. But these are really efficient. And this is how we can get that kind of 10 millisecond uh, read time, because it's, it's normally just a single seek you know, one I.O. and you're done. Or hopefully it's even in cache. So yeah, we can do where geography is UK, group by user, 
We could even just say how many events we had in total in this database, and we can do group by geography as well. OK, so that's the more general solution. Finally, you know, what I normally get asked about this, this is where it gets really interesting, if you ask me. What I usually get asked is, OK, this is great. We can do count. OK, from count, you can do sum, and from sum and count, you can do uh, you know, average, and you can even do count of uh, x squared, so we can do standard deviations and variances and so on. We can do all of these functions, but underneath the hood, you're still just counting things. But count can be easily extended to things like min and max. Okay, that that's not rocket science, and I'm sure you guys can uh, can work out how you do that. But really, it gets a lot more complicated when you say, okay, how do I do count distinct? Okay, count distinct on a you know a billion item data set. How do I do count distinct in the same way? Or maybe how do I do top k? How do I say give me the top ten? And remember, what I'm really trying to avoid here is a scan through the whole data set, because then it's really hard to do that query in real time. You have to force it into RAM or, or use very, you know, much uh, more expensive indexes to update. I'm looking for indexes that are cheap to update and that can give me you know, more complicated functions. And actually, I've got a little bit of a theory about this. For some functions, I, I postulate, I haven't got a proof for this, but I postulate that you can only have two out of these three things. You can have exact and you can have real time. You know, exact and real time is easy because MySQL does that. But MySQL isn't very large scale. You know, you can't have a well, maybe well, I know some people do, but you can't have very large inst installs of MySQL. Um, you can have exact and large scale because that's Hadoop, right? Hadoop is it gives you exact answers, works very well at large scale, but it's not real time. Now, what we're looking for actually is the other trade-off, which is real time and large scale. And the thing we're going to allow to be sacrificed to achieve that is exactness. So we're going to have, OK, how do we do approximate analytics? If I could ask the query, please tell me the number of distinct visitors to my incredibly high traffic website, uh, you know, and the query, the answer is going to be really large, then I don't actually care if it's plus or minus 1%. That's probably good enough. So how would we do approximate count distinct? That's the answer. That's the, that's the example I'm going to give here. So really, um, the easy way of doing count distinct, the non-approximate way of doing it, is uh, just keep a list of all the things you've seen and then count the number of distinct items in that list when you do the query. Okay, so this is good, right? This is easy to update because you just add something to the end of the list. However, it doesn't really scale, right? Because that list is going to get really big. It's going to take up a lot of space and it's gonna, you're going to have to scan through and, and compute the query at query time and this is going to be expensive. So we're looking for an alternative. So the alternative we've got, this we didn't invent this, right? Um, I didn't invent this. This is actually um, pretty well known. It's from uh, lots of CEP engines do this. It's called Hyperloglog, -Log, and it's a really neat solution. Hopefully, I've got a nice, easy way of explaining this. What we're going to do is we're going to hash every element we see coming through the stream of, uh, stream of data. So we've got an element x. We take the hash, and everyone should know what a hash is. A hash is just a, a random series of ones and zeros but it's deterministic. For every x you put in, you'll get the same hash. But the hashes should also be uniformly distributed. So you know, even if x has got some weird distribution, the hashes of x should always be uniform. And that's key to this process. So then what we're going to do is we're going to count the number of leading zeros in that hash. OK, you can see in this hash it starts with two zeros, so the leading zero is two. And then we're going to keep track of the maximum number of leading zeros we've seen in the hashes of all our elements. OK, so we've seen two. We do it a few more times, maybe we see three leading zeros. So this is the reason this is, uh, this is good, right, is the chance of seeing a single leading zero, given that it's uniformly random, is a half. Okay? The chance of seeing two leading zeros is a quarter. Chance of seeing three is an eighth. You, know, you can see it's going one over two to the, to the n. Now, if you flip that around, if I've seen three leading zeros, then on average I'm going to have seen eight distinct items, two to the three distinct items. OK? So there's your way of doing approximate analytics. Hash and keep track of the maximum number of leading zeros. I mean, zero doesn't have to be special, right? It could be leading ones or any leading pattern. But, but still, uh, leading, you know, we just do leading zeros in simplicity. So this is great. So we can now, with a very small amount of space and very easy to update, you know, I said previously we can do maximal counters very, very easily. We can now keep track of the number of approximate, approximate number of distinct items in a stream. However, you can probably see this isn't really a very satisfactory solution. Okay, you can see that 
it's not going to be very accurate. You know, it's going to take one item that happens to hash and have four leading zeros to say, oh, you've seen, you know, what's two to the 16 distinct things, and uh, you've actually only seen one. And so that's not very accurate, right? Plus, you can only ever tell you when you've seen powers of two. Uh, and that's, you know, it's great. You've seen 1,024 things, or you've seen 2,048, but it'll never tell you anything in between, which kind of sucks. So really, we want a way now where we can make this more accurate by maybe making, you know, maybe giving it a bit more state. And it turns out that's also equally easy. What we do is we actually take the input stream and we split it into n, or m in this case, substreams. Okay? And all we do to, to, assign, a, um, to assign an item, to assign an event to a substream, we just use a few more uh, digits from that hash. So maybe we take the first two digits from the hash, and that will give us forced substreams. And we just use that as the index into what substream this is. So this is this this event we've got here is substream zero, and it's got no leading zeros after that uh, index. So you know we we store zero zero, and then we see maybe you know a new event coming in is substream three and has a single leading zero, and a new event after that is substream zero again and has a leading zero, and then we just keep this vector of maximal counters that just tells us for all the substreams how many leading zeros have we seen, okay? And then, to find out how many distinct items we've seen, we take the, effectively, we just take the average of, the, of that vector. So this is really powerful, right? This is powerful because if you want more accuracy, you just divide it up into more substreams. But that's going to use more space, and it's going to take longer to qu query time. So it gives you that trade-off between accuracy and query time, which is exactly what we were looking for. Now, I've got some notes on this slide that you guys can now all see which says the, uh, the accuracy of this is 1 over square root of the number of substreams you've got. And a good example is for 16 kilobyte sketch, we call this uh, array of maximal counters, we can get to within 2% accuracy with 95% confidence for 2 million distinct items. So this is pretty, uh, this is pretty impressive. And what's more, this doesn't uh, scale. This scales with the number of distinct items. I don't think this scales with the number of... Uh, number of events, which is good, which is what you want. So there we go. That's pretty much how we do approximate count distinct. Um, yeah, I'm now giving you the three examples of how to do, you know, how to do a very simple real-time analytics query on, on Cassandra, how to maybe generalize that into, you know, more general sort of where clauses and group clauses, and now how to do more complicated count distinct queries. I'm not going to show you how to do top K. Um, we, we're running out of time for that. Um, finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about how this would fit architecturally. So we've built this thing. You know, you can buy it off us if you want, uh, or you can build it yourself. But really, what we do is we just in ingest these events into it. It's a big Java blob we've written. It takes JSON events and it issues these counter updates onto a Cassandra cluster. And this moves all the work onto the ingest phase, aggregates everything uh, incrementally. You know, this is a benchmark of our product, but you could see how this general approach, you know, it's hard to benchmark an approach, it's easy to benchmark a, an actual piece of code. This, you can see how this approach is significantly faster than doing exactly the same thing in MySQL. So this is about 10 times faster than doing the same thing in MySQL. The, the stats behind this benchmark was, um, this was all run on EC2. This, uh, the MySQL instance was an RDS instance, because Amazon nicely set it up with sensible defaults and so on. And the, the uh, Kuno Analytics instance was just a single M1 X large instance. Um, the workload we applied to this was a, a sort of uh, Google Analytics workload, exactly like I showed you in example two, where we basically, for every 10 events we ingest, we do a query that kind of builds your Google Analytics dashboard. And we can see that doing that kind of thing with Akuno Analytics is at least 10 times faster than MySQL. Uh, yeah, now I'll just plug in the product. Sorry about this. We've got, uh, we've got a dashboard UI. Actually, I thought I could show you some of this because I think this is really neat. Um, and we've got some people using it. Let's show you the dashboard UI. Where is that? So this is, uh, we haven't released this yet, this is still kind of a beta, but here you can see the kind of, you know, one of the, one of the, um, one of the things I didn't mention was really with this whole approach, as opposed to sort of the more standard uh, Hadoop approach, you have to pre-declare your queries. You have to say up front, I'm going to want you to aggregate these things um, for it to be able to answer them in real time. Now, you know, we allow you to do that, so you can say this is the types of, uh, of my events. You know, the, I'm doing some bus data uh, in London 
the uh, transport network has a feed, a real-time feed of all the buses going around the, around the city. And so we're ingesting this live into this uh, machine. And, um, you know, the, the feed we're ingesting just says the time, what is this, this is arrivals. So that every time a bus arrives at a stop, we get an event that says bus has arrived at a stop. Here's the bus registration number, the bus name, the bus line, you know, the stop name, and so on. And then we've got some queries we've pre-declared that says I'm going to count, you know, the all sorts of things. You look at this one, I'm saying I want to know if I specify a time and a stop name, I want you to give me uh, the count of all the different buses in that time range for that for grouped by line name and so on. So we pre-declare all these queries. And then if we go to this dashboard, you can see in real time, so I'm, this is actually running over a VPN, so it's a little bit slow, but you can see in real time, it's actually telling us this is in the last two hours, how many arrivals we've had, you know, in the last two hours, basically grouped by minute is here. Or maybe we've said grouped by wait time, and we can start to see, you know, the distribution of wait times in the last two hours um, in London, basically, in the entire London. You can see this is updating every five seconds and giving us slightly new values. You can see average wait times. And we can do even more stuff, so this is where it gets really cool. Maybe we're going to show, please show me the number of arrivals grouped by hour over the past 24 hours. Actually, no. I'm going to say two days ago, because then we can see some nice diurnal patterns. And there we go. We can see over the past two days, these are all the buses arrived. And the great thing you can see, you know, overnight, there's less buses, which is what you'd expect. Now, the thing that I think is really neat here is show me the total number of buses in the past 24 hours. Uh, yeah, show me the total number of buses on the road in the past 24 hours. Do, 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 do. Uh, just need a metric for that. So there are 8,000 buses on the road in the last, different buses, these are distinct registration numbers on the road in the last 24 hours. And we could even, you know, uh, I don't think we've enabled that in real time to do more complicated things. But yeah, we could if we enabled it and, and told the system ahead of time, you know, show me the distinct number of buses on the road over time, then we could do that as well. And that, I think, is pretty much it for my talk. Yeah, if, uh, if any of you are in London, there's this fantastic service called Halo. It's actually how I got here today. Which, uh, which is an app on your phone which allows you to book, uh, allows you to book a taxi. And these guys use, uh, use Acuna Analytics and use all these techniques I've described to, um, you know, to, to get sort of dashboards for their business. And I think they even use it to publish some data back to the drivers. And there's another company as well called Mixcloud that do the same thing. Great. Cool. Excellent. Thanks very much, Tom. Thank you, John. Um, OK, so I've asked for questions on the... Um, uh, on the Google Plus page, but there's there's nothing there at the minute. It, um, if anyone's got any questions in the Hangout, just give me a shout. I uh, will type something into the group chat, and I'll uh, make sure it gets to to Tom. Um, but I was wondering. So one of the key things that I understand about Cassandra is um, it, it lets you scale out commodity mm -hmm. hardware, so you can build a scalable database. Exactly. Yeah. Um, not a centralized. So no distributed no master so how does that um, d does that mean you need to as you with analytics the way you've developed it when you get more data in there um, or more types of queries you want to perform do you need to think about scaling out or is it actually a fairly small cluster will do you up to a very large range of data that's a good question, yeah. So the great thing about this approach to analytics and our implementation of this is that it's completely stateless. When you get an event, all the processing you do on that event you know, doesn't matter about other events or anything. So it can be done in isolation, and it's scalable. So um, the typical deployment we see is you put, a, you put this Java blob of Acuna Analytics on every machine, and it scales with the number of machines. Right. So that that's really good for scalability. That's really good for failover. You know, you just don't have to worry about the failover of this component. Now, the second bit of that question was, you know, how does the uh, how do you need to scale the 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 cluster based on the complexity of the queries you want, you ask? And sure, the the big I, I hope it was clear in the talk. The big um, the big thing with Akuna Analytics and this whole approach is, the more queries you ask, the more counters you have to keep up to date. So, you know, if, if I'm just asking, well, if I'm asking no queries, 
then I don't have to do any work when I ingest an event. You know, I can literally just throw the event away because you're never going to ask me anything. You know, and if I start asking, you know, more, more and more queries, then I'm going to have to keep more and more counters up to date. Now, it's not as simple as for every, um, you know, for every query you have to keep one counter up to date because you might, for instance, one of the things we've got in uh, in Acuna Analytics is the ability to define your bucketing. So you can see here on this time uh, dimension. We've, uh, we've specified, I want you to keep time bucketed by day, hour, minute, and second. Sure. So that means every time I ingest uh, an event, I'm going to have to at least do four counters because I've got four buckets for time. And now actually, the, um, you know, it, it's even more complicated than that, but that's the rough sort of, uh, the rough gist of it. And what you can see again, sorry, on the, uh, on the thing is we actually tell you, because we can approximate the number of counters that will need to be updated per event. And here it says for this particular schema, for these queries, we're updating about 100 counters every time you ingest an event. And that allows you to kind of do a bit of sizing, rough sizing calculation and say, OK, well, if I know my Cassandra cluster can do 50,000 counters a second or 100,000 counters a second, and I'm doing 100 counters per event, then I can do roughly 1,000 events a second. Yeah. Okay. We typically see 100 quite high. I think uh, we've had some people back in the office playing with this. But um, we typically see you know, maybe 30 or 40 being the number of counters updated per event, you know, with our, with our customers. And given that, you know, a Cassandra cluster can do tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of counter updates a second, it's pretty easy to scale this system to tens of thousands of events a second. So there's a, there's a relatively easy uh, to, to comprehend algorithm that you can look at and say, right, yeah, we yeah, expose exactly. the number of counters, you know what your throughput is, scale out. Exactly, yeah. There's, it, 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 there are some sort of subtleties to it, but effectively, yeah, you can... And the great thing is, if it's slow, then you just add more nodes to it. You know, if it's easy to, spin up a few more machines, add them to it, and, and you're done. And if you um, have data that's gone through already, and then you decide you want to do another type of query, you would need to um, either replay all the data through so those counters were updated? Or yeah, exactly. Yeah. So with, with the techniques I've described, yeah. you, you'd have to do that to, yeah. to sort of recalculate your indexes. Now actually, um, our product, which you're seeing here, has, you know, does that all for you. And you can see we've actually, you know, I said before, you know, the big difference between um, you know, Akuno Analytics and Hadoop is Hadoop's great for ad hoc and Akuno Analytics real time. Well, actually, we've got ad hoc queries as well. So you can even start, you know, one of the queries I said we might want to do was uh, registration numbers over the past uh, two days. So we can go two days ago. You know, these queries weren't enabled in the schema, so we couldn't do them in real time, but we can do them in ad hoc, and it's going to behave a lot like a Hadoop query. Oh, geez. And so we can say group by hour and run. And then this is, you know, this is a similar workflow. Any, everyone will be familiar with this, it's like submitting an event to Hadoop. And this is only a, a single machine, so it's only doing a sort of 50,000 uh, events a second processing, but um, but yeah, you'll see if the talk goes on for long enough, we'll come back and there'll be a nice graph there. <laughs> yeah, so you can so you can still do the exploratory work. You don't have to yeah. redefine everything up front. Uh, the data is still there for you to query over in, in exactly. its sort of raw form. Exactly. But then there's the option to once you've discovered what the queries are to replay. Well, exactly. And the, build the indexes. The life cycle of the of the kind of query in Acuna Analytics really is we see people using this this ad hoc stuff a lot. But only to define what they want to what they want to show in real time. Mm -hmm. You know, the, this this technique is perfect for building, you know, a, a BI dashboard that's going to be sitting on a monitor in your ops room or something. Mm -hmm. Or you know, we see actually this this whole interface works really well on the iPad, and we see a lot of people using it on their iPad to like show reports in meetings and things. Mm -hmm. So you know, you set up your reports. Um, you know, you investigate what you want to show using ad hoc. Once you've found what it is you want to show, you turn them into real time queries. And then every meeting, you pull out your iPad and go, oh, well, it's doing this. OK, excellent. Um, OK, so no other questions have come through on the chat. Uh, and uh, so let me just check. Um, no, nope, there's no other questions on Google+. Plus. So we will, um, we will leave it there. Uh, thanks very much, Tom. That was, that was really interesting. And um, yeah, hopefully that's given people some insight into how you can uh, look at building real time analytics uh, with Cassandra. All right. Thanks very much, Tom. Thanks, guys. Cheers.